and uh, we just pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Good evening. Well, I'm really happy to be here, really thrilled to be here at this base. Uh, I have a tremendous respect for uh, Pete and Cheryl especially and for the rest of the leadership here. Uh, actually, Pete and Cheryl were two of the first YWAMers I ever met. Uh, I, was, I met a Tongan guy named Kalafi Mawala back in 1979. Boy, it makes me sound like a dinosaur. But um, back in 1979, uh, they had an outreach to the South Pacific Games in Fiji. So uh, Kalafi recruited me to go to that, so I went, and then I met Peter and Shirley and uh, Tom Hallis and some of the other Aussies that were there, and uh, I've been close friends with them ever since, so I'm really happy to be here, and uh, can't believe it's been just a little over 40 years. I was wandering around in circles, an opal-fared, long-haired, leaping gnome down in Santa Cruz, California, and somebody walked up to me and gave me a gospel tract and said Jesus could change my life. I had taken about 50 or 60 hits of LSD the, pre the previous uh, eight months of my life and blew my short-term memory out, and to the glory of God, somebody gave me a Bible and said, you believe this, you read it, and it'll change your life, and it did, and I was healed, and uh, I'm here to give God all the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what I want to talk about tonight is I was kind of toying with two different, two or three different uh, titles. Titles don't mean much, but uh, one is called Foundations for Faith, and another uh, title is called Facing the Future with Faith. We were talking with a couple of the leaders just at dinner time about future. What's, what's YWAM going to look like in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time? Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of movements like YWAM and church history have started out like a rocket ship and crashed like a rocket ship. Uh, losing their faith, losing the original vision of the founders, and you can look at church history and you can see the church history is littered with corpses of organizations and ministries like YWAM that had young people, that had women, that had prayer, that had evangelism, that had fire, and yet um, they weren't able to sustain it over a couple of generations. Lauren Cunningham's 83 now, and he's still going strong, but he's 83. And uh, we were just with him the other day, and he's doing really well health-wise, but uh, we've got to start thinking about the future, and we've got to start thinking about the Great Commission, and how can we, you know, round that last turn and just head towards the completion of the Great Commission, and you guys are uh, going to help out with that, but what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about faith. I'll let you know where I'm going. I got three points. It's a good three-point sermon. We'll have three points in a poem, and then we'll quit, uh, but number one is we want to talk about the faith as a noun, the faith. Then we're going to talk about faith as a verb, something that you do, you believe. That's what faith is. And the third thing we want to talk about is the adjective of being faithful. Are you a faithful person? So we'll talk about that as we get there. But in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Over in, uh, found in um, uh, Psalm 11, verse 3, it tells us, that if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Now, one of my uh, talents is uh, before I joined YWAM, I learned how to finish cement and do concrete work. And one of the things I can tell you, even though I wasn't here when they poured these slabs here, I can tell you that they have a footing and they have foundations and they have extra concrete to be able to hold up the walls and so forth and so on. But somebody has to think ahead of time and somebody has to think of where we're going to have our foundations, how much rebar is supposed to be in there, how the rebar is to be put together so that if there is an earthquake or there is some type of a, a catastrophe that would happen, uh, that, we, the, that the building would be able to stand. When I was doing cement work, I remember the inspector was always the guy we always hated because he would come and he would nitpick us to death if our rebar was off or if we weren't quite deep enough on our foundations and our footings, and uh, it was just a drag. So some of the, of course, this is before I became a Christian, uh, we would pay off the guy so that he wouldn't uh, be too hard on us. But the fact of the matter is stadiums have collapsed and people have been killed and other things have happened because people cut the corners with regards to the foundations of, the, of, the, of their buildings. And so what I want to talk about is building for a foundation for the future so that we can have the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints, so we can believe God for miracles and for the completion of the Great Commission, and so that we can be faithful people to give ourselves to that, whether we feel uh, like it or not. But I'd like to uh, just read a couple of verses to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3... Paul the Apostle made an incredible statement. He said, I am, uh, according to the grace of God, I am an expert builder. 
And the Greek word there means an architect. So he's an expert builder. Now, he was either full of pride to say, well, I'm an expert, or he really was an expert, and he was just telling the truth. No brag, just fact. I'm an expert builder. And so he had strategies, and he had schemes, and he had things that he thought through to build the foundation for the churches that he was going to have. But he was quick to say that no foundation can be laid except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is our foundation. Then he goes into chapter 4, and he starts getting into these metaphors. First, he talks about building, then he talks about planting, uh, and he talks about different visual, you know, kind of uh, what we might call uh, word pictures to help us understand what he's talking about as we prepare for a life of faith. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, which shall be miraculously appearing on the screen at any time, I think. Um, do we have it? I saw it up there earlier. Okay, we'll just read it. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul said, So then, men ought to regard us as the servants of Christ and those entrusted with the mysteries of God. Now it is required in stewardship that a man who has been chosen to have a trust be proved faithful. So we'll talk about faithfulness a little bit more. But there's an interesting word here. Paul said God has chosen us to be stewards, uh, chosen us to be servants. Now, the normal word for servant in the Bible is the word doulos, from which we get our word slave. But in this particular text, he uses a different word, and it's a word that uh, is, is, can be translated an under rower. Now, if you ever saw the old Ben-Hur movies or some of the movies about galley slaves back in the old days, there would be some big buff guy up there, and he would be whipping the slaves to try to help them to keep rowing in the same direction. So Paul used the lowest possible word for slave to say that's what we are. We're apostles. We're expert builders. We're going to go into all the world, but we've got to keep the good ship YWAM going in the same direction. So we need people that are down in the trenches, down in the galley, to do the rowing so that the boat and the ship can get to where it's supposed to go. Then he says we need to be stewards of the mysteries God has given to us. Now what the mysteries were was back in those days there were these uh, mystery religions and they were false religions and basically Paul was saying you want mystery? We'll give you mystery. But the mystery is that the Gentiles and the Jews have come together in God's plan for him to be able to uh, put his kingdom to be worldwide around the world. But he uses that word steward. Now, back in those days, you had a household, and the household was run by the householder. He was the boss. Then you had your household slaves. Then you had your extended household people, like your aunties and your uncles and your grandmas. And then you had the household steward. And the steward's job was to, on Monday morning, go to the householder and say, what do you want this week? Well, I want to have a barbecue on Wednesday night, and I want to do this on Thursday night. And so the steward would take the wishes of the householder, and he would be the steward of that. And this guy didn't have to nitpick the steward. The steward, the steward knew the heart of the person that was the householder who was the boss. And so he would arrange the slaves to do their stuff, and then he would make sure auntie and uncle are taken care of, and then he would go out and buy the food because he knew it was on sale that week. And so he would be able to get through everything so he could please the one who had chosen him to be a steward. And it says here that we are faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, my first point is, is that we need to nurture something called the faith. I'm going to quote a couple of verses. In Jude verse 3, there's a verse that said this. He's writing and he says, I wanted to write to you folks a gospel tract about the simple gospel of Christ but the problem with there was these false teachers came in, so I have to encourage you to stand strong and to contend, that word means to fight, to contend for the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints. Then he predicted, Paul predicted in 1 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 4, he predicted that in the latter times, in the last days, which I think we're living in right now, in the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines taught by demons. And then there's other places in the book of Matthew, for instance, where Jesus predicted that in the end times, there was going to be a, a falling away from the faith, or what they call an apostasy. 
Now, that has been happening to organizations like YWAM, like I said earlier, um, all throughout church history, but there's a special, apparently a massive, demonic, dark attack on the church in the last days to get us away from the faith. Now, I can't speak for the Aussies here, but for the Americans that are here and anybody else that wants to look on social media, you can see there is an attack on the Bible as God's word. In other words, we're stewards of these mysteries. We have these precious truths. It's the faith, which was once for all entrusted to the saints. Acts chapter two, it says they continued in the apostles' teaching. So there's a certain amount of content that we need to guard and we need to put down as a foundation for our lives so that we don't fall into this thing. Now, I live in Kona, and uh, this is where Lauren Cunningham lives, and I want to report to you that uh, Lauren Cunningham is an absolute obsessive compulsive fanatic for getting the Bible into every home in the world. His wife actually told us in a meeting one time that Lauren is as excited about this new vision that he has to be able to get the Bible to every home in the world, whether it be electronic Bibles or paper Bibles or whatever kind of Bibles we can get them, so that we can saturate the whole world with the Word of God. And if you haven't noticed, there are people dropping like flies all over the body of Christ, whether it be in Europe, whether it be down under, whether it be in uh, in America, where... uh, it's not, it's not so important what you believe anymore. In fact, we need more orthopraxy and not so much orthodoxy. We need to do the stuff and not so much believe dry, dead, dusty doctrine. And you see things like this being told about the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints. And so uh, it was very interesting. I happened to be there in 1977 when Lauren dedicated the University of the Nations in Kona, Hawaii. And I will never forget, I got the Holy Ghost heebie-jeebies when he was praying because he got up and he said, this university of the nations is to be founded on the Bible as the word of God. And as he has a tendency to do when he gets really upset, he said, and he got a real stern look on his face and he started yelling really loud and he said, Father, in the name of Jesus, if the university of the nations ever gets away from the Bible being the foundation for everything we do, every class we teach, every outreach we have, then I pray that you would destroy this university. <laughs> okay. But uh, this was the seriousness of Lauren. Now, about two months ago, my wife and I, <clears throat> by the way, we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Hallelujah. Uh, Hallelujah, with that response, I think we should take another offering for me. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But um, on our 40th anniversary, my wife and I traveled around the United States to see some friends, and we stopped in at Oral Roberts University, which is one of the biggest, best Pentecostal Bible colleges in America. And um, they had a video clip going on one of these, um, you know, repeating again and again uh, as you were in the little, little entrance to the place, their little visitor center. And Billy Graham was dedicating Oral Roberts University back in 1965. And so Billy and Oral were really good friends being evangelists back in those days. Billy was at the top of his game at that point, and so was Oral. And Billy gets up, and just on the little clip that I saw, Billy Graham said this, and I quote, He said, Lord, I dedicate this university to the glory of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if Oral Roberts University ever gets away from the Bible being the foundation, I place a divine curse on this university if they don't stick true with the word of God. Woo, I had the shakes again after I saw that. But it was because these men prophesied forward, they know what's coming. Dark times are coming again, but as the darkness gets darker, how many of you know we can get the light to be brighter? And that's what we need to do in guarding the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints. Now, how many of you come from a, um, a, a church tradition in which they would recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or something like that? Have you ever heard words like this? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, suffered, and died. And then there's a part in the creed that says this. True God of true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, who for us men and for our salvation and so forth. And I was looking at that one day and saying, Why did these guys nitpick so much begotten, not made? What difference does it make if he was begotten, not made? It's still Jesus. Then it says, of one substance with the Father. 
did a little research on this. The word sus- substance is the word homoousios. It simply means of one, the same stuff. Like Daniel, my son, will be up here next week, and he's made of layman stuff. He's a layman. Good, bad, or ugly, he's made of layman stuff. And so because he's a layman, he's just as much of a layman as I am, but he's made of layman stuff. Jesus is made of God stuff. Jesus is God. And it says that this is to be the creed. This is what we believe. I believe in one God, and cetera. And it goes through. Now, why did they nitpick so much? I don't know, but I can tell you it was important to them because they had to understand what was the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints. In YWAM, we have these things called foundational values. We have other little covenants that we have, like the, the Magna Carta. We have other, the, uh, uh, the Lausanne Covenant is another one that we had. And these are things I would encourage you to look over because these have to do with the foundations of who we are. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, not only people like Lauren Cunningham, but people like Martin Luther. We're coming up on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation this October when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door and um, the clerks and imperial bishops got on his case and said, you know, we got a wild, they actually called Luther a pig. They said he's a wild pig that is loose in the Lord's vineyard. And Luther stood before these bishops, and they were just about to kill him. And he stood there, and he said, Your illustrious lordships deserve an answer, and I will give you an answer. Unless I am convinced by Scripture or by the Word of God that we are not justified by faith and that the Bible is not the Word of God, then I will not recant. Here I stand, so help me God. And you know what? You would not be sitting here today, and I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for Martin Luther. But these were foundational stones that need to be in our lives. And it's not just what we do. It's what we believe. Go and take this gospel into all the world, Jesus said. Okay. Number two, we need to be able to have faith. Now, I wanna, what I would like to do here is just to examine the anatomy of faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things that are hoped for in Hebrews 11.1. Faith is the substance of things that are hoped for and the evidence of things we cannot see. Okay, so faith is something that has to do with something invisible. There's another verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, says this. It's a command. It says, do not, do not look at the things which you can see because the things which you can see are temporary and the things which you cannot see are eternal. Very simple. Don't look at the things you can see because they're going to pass away. Look at the things you can't see. And I felt like going to heaven and getting with Paul and saying, hey, Paul, why did you tell us to look at things we can't see? That doesn't make any sense. Because the only way you can look at things you can't see is you see them by faith. But that's the essence of faith. Faith is something that does not rely on your senses. Faith is something that you believe. And we have to have an active faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, it tells us in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us we walk by faith and not by sight. So the sight is something that we have by faith even though we can't see it. Now I'd like to talk for a minute uh, about the issue of the presence of God. And before you throw me out of here on my ear, hear me out till I'm done. But um, somebody came to me one time and they said, Danny, we just came back from a conference and it said we need to be, we need to be presence-centered. Okay, what's that mean? We need to be centered upon the presence of God. Okay, Um, how do I do that? I get up every morning, I have a quiet time, I read my Bible, I fill in my journal, I kiss my wife, I uh, feed my dog, uh, I take a prayer walk, I go out into the day, I try to share the gospel, I try to love people, I try to keep my mind clean from sin, and... um, try to eat decent food, what else can I do to go after this presence of God? And how am I going to know if I caught it, if I'm supposed to chase it? Well, you got to, I don't know, you just got to have the, I said, what do you mean? It's some kind of a mystical mist or something? Is it a feeling? Is it a a urier I get in my stomach? Is it a, what what is it? Oh, you just got to, you just got to have it. And, And I could never get anything out of this particular person that I was talking to. So I did a little Bible study. This is what I found. In the Bible, there are at least four ways that the presence of God is mentioned. Number one is what we would call in theology the omnipresence of God. 
Theologians like big confusing words like omnipresence. But omnipresence means he's everywhere at once. God is here, God is there. Um, uh, Ari is sitting right here, and he's this far away from me. Now I'm closer to him, okay? Now, can we get closer to God? Well, how do you get closer to a God that's everywhere? Gets a little twisted up, doesn't it? But the Bible does give us a second kind of experience with the presence of God, and it's what we call the manifest presence of God. All of a sudden, everybody perks up. Yeah, man, give it to him, Danny. We're going to talk about the manifest presence of God here, speaking in tongues, prophesying, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, uh, the, the, the laughing, falling, crying, whatever it might be. Isn't it great to see the presence of God? Yes. And it does say back in 2 Chronicles that the priests could not stand to minister because the presence of God was so thick in the sanctuary. Now, full disclosure here on your behalf. How many of you have ever been in a meeting like tonight, and you'll be in a meeting and you'll turn to the person next to you and say, man, the worship is insane. It was incredible. The presence of God was so thick in that place you could cut it with a knife. Didn't you feel God's presence? And you go, I didn't feel nothing. <laughs> no, man, God was there. He showed up in his manifest glory. He, he exploded. The glory of God exploded in the place. It was incredible. And you go to somebody that wasn't in the meeting, and they say, it was incredible. God just showed up, man. That bass player girl over there, as soon as she hit that bass, the whole place exploded with the glory of God. <laughs> and then you go to somebody else that was in the same meeting and say, were you in that meeting? Yeah. I heard the place exploded last night. I didn't, I didn't hear nothing explode. I don't know what anybody's talking about. So how many of you ever, you really felt it, the person next to you didn't, or the person next to you felt it, and you didn't feel it? Amen? All right. Hang on. Number three is what we call the conditional presence of God, and that's um, you draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Now, again, can I get closer to Ari? Yeah. But God's not talking spatially here. Like, God's everywhere, but he's more everywhere, everywhere than he was yesterday. No, you go crazy thinking like that. It's nearness is likeness. You're closer to God the more you're like God's. That's what A.W. Tozer said, and I agree with him. But there's a fourth aspect of the presence of God, and here's the one you're not going to like. But it's there, and you've all experienced it. It's what I call the absent presence of God. I have a theologian friend that helped write a, a Bible dictionary. He was in, used to teach in our schools in YWAM. He passed on. Uh, his name was Dr. Ronald Youngblood, and he's an expert on the Psalms. That was his specialty of his scholarship. And he told me that 58 of the 150 Psalms are what we call Psalms of Lament. Have you ever read the Bible where David is going, God, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forsaken me? I cry unto you in the day, and I cry unto you at night, and I, you can't hear me, and the, the heathen get all the good stuff, and I get all the junk, and I don't understand this, Lord, and why do you hide yourself all the time? And, uh, the enemy seems to be chasing me, and I can't seem to get any rest, and my eyes are full of tears day and night. Oh, God, this, this life is a drag. That's what 58 of the 150 Psalms are like. I was um, uh, director of a YWAM base uh, a few years ago, and I had one of our staff come to us. He says, Danny, I got to talk to you. I said, what? He says, I'm going to go home. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm just dead on the inside. Dry as dust, man. I just, I don't have any living water. I'm just, that's just bad, man. It's bad, you know. And I, I felt like getting on a shovel and burying the guy right there on the spot. <laughs> but uh, figured I would help him. So I, um, I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, everybody else gets excited in the worship times. They're jumping up and down, and the young people come forward, and it's all great. People are rolling in the aisles and foaming at the mouth with the presence of God. It's really great. And, um, but I just feel kind of dead. So being a good leader, I poked around a little bit and tried to see if there's any sin in his life. You know, uh, you know, put my stethoscope on his heart. You got any porno situation going on here? You got something else happening? You know, and, and, I, and, I, and the guy was clean. He was okay. I said... You gave us a two-year commitment to stay here. Amen? He said, yeah. And I said, it's only been six months you've been here, right? He said, amen. I said, I haven't heard you say that God told you to go. I heard you say you're dead or you don't have any, you're dry as dust and all this. But you haven't told me that God told you to leave, so I don't think I should let you go until you tell me God tells you to leave. Now, if God tells you to leave, who am I to tell you to stay? And, uh, and I said, but let me suggest something to you. And I read to him a verse out of Psalm 50, verse 10, and I'll just quote it. It says, 
Who is he among you who fears the Lord? And maybe not it's a good thing. Good thing to fear the Lord, amen? All right. Thank you for that spontaneous response. I appreciate that. Who is he among you who fears the Lord and who obeys the words of the Lord's servant? And if you know anything about the book of Isaiah, the Lord's servant is Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus. So who is he among you who fears the Lord and obeys Jesus, but walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. It's very simple. But, well, now wait a minute. You go back to the book of John, and it's very clear in the book of John and in the writings of John, don't abide in darkness, abide in the light. Walk in the light, and you shall not fulfill the works of the darkness. And light is a good thing, and darkness is a bad thing all throughout the Bible. But in this verse, it's a good, God-fearing, godly-walking, holy guy, obeying, obeying Jesus that is in the darkness. Now, there was a 13th century, 16th century monk who read this verse one day, and he had had some experience in his monastery with the presence of God kind of leaving him for long periods of time. Or at least he thought God's presence was leaving him. He knew God was omnipresent, and he was doing his best to draw near to God, but he couldn't feel the manifest presence of God. He didn't sense God was with him. So he started to get depressed at, until he saw that this darkness here is actually allowed by God himself. God's not the one, uh, or it's not the devil. Usually when we don't feel the presence of God, the first thing we do is say, I rebuke you, devil. Get away from me. <laughs> and of course, we expect the devil to go, okay, okay. But <laughs> How many of you know if you don't have any authority in your life and you say, get, 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 get out of here, devil, he'll say, oh, yeah? <laughs> I got authority to be here. No, you don't. Yes, you do. You don't. So you go back and forth on that. But... Um, this is what John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. And the dark night of the soul is when God somehow will withdraw his presence because he loves you and because he doesn't want to have to put on a dog and a pony show for you every time you come into the presence of God so that you'll stay on the team. How many of you know that sometimes you have bad days? Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 13 was in Lystra and they practiced bouncing big rock boulders off of his head. His skull is being crushed, and he says, well, I don't feel the presence of God. No, all he could feel was headaches and so forth because he was in a situation of persecution. Sometimes God allows negative things to come into our life, and we don't even have to, it doesn't, is it the devil, is it God, is it, was it too much pizza the night before, what was it, how come? You don't have to answer those questions. God is sovereign over your life, and sometimes because he loves you and because he wants you to grow in faith, he will allow the dark times to come into your life. And sometimes it's the devil, and sometimes you got to rebuke the devil and get back in the light, and sometimes you're in sin and you got to get out of sin. But once you clear all those things out of the way and you're still in this feeling of darkness, I want to encourage you. It's because God is trying to help you to grow in faith. It's what we call trials, tribulations. Tribulations work patience and so forth and so on. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now, I want to prophesy to you here. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I'm going to prophesy. To every one of you, whatever you are going through in your life right now, especially if you are in the dark night of the soul, it's because God is trying to get you to trust him. Because trusting God is what it's all about. Remember, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please in God please God. The disciples came to Christ and they said, Lord, increase our faith. It's all about faith. But faith starts out with being founded on the faith, and then it proceeds with us um, continuing to walk in faith. Let me try to illustrate it for you. Uh, I was at a, uh, a couple years ago, a police officer called me up and said, Danny, we're having a neighborhood board meeting. We've had some break-ins in the area and we would like you to come to this board meeting. Now, I wasn't leading it or anything. I was just one of the neighbors, and so I went to this meeting. I was late getting to the meeting. The sun was just setting over the mountains, and so I'm uh, driving my car, and the parking lot of the cafeteria where they were holding the meeting with the police officers was filled up. So I drove about three blocks down. I'm a little bit late for the meeting, so I start jogging up the street to try to get to the meeting on time. 
It's in a school cafeteria that I'm familiar with because I used to play basketball there with my kids. And so I'm running up, and I jump onto the sidewalk, and then I hop up these concrete stairs onto the football field. I go across the football field to the parking lot, then go across the parking lot and go into the meeting. We have the meeting, they give some um, brochures out and so forth, and then we come out. I'm hungry, so I come out and I want to get back home and eat. So I, I walk across, now it's dark, and I'm walking across the dark parking lot. Really fast, in a hurry, no problem, because I can see where I'm going because uh, the lights are on. And I'm walking across the asphalt of the parking lot, and then I go toward the darkened football field. But football fields are flat, and there's no big holes in it, so I'm, I'm continuing to walk really fast, and I'm walking across this thing, and I'm, I can't see where I'm going because I'm in the darkness, and the lights were on back in the cafeteria and back in the parking lot, but the lights were not on now. Then my memory kicked in, and I went, I better slow down here because there's a bunch of concrete stairs coming up, and I went like this, there's the top stair, and then I walked down the stairs, went off to my car. Now, what happened? I had remembered in the darkness what I had learned in the light. And wow. That's pretty good, huh? About every two and a half years, I say something profound. I must have just hit it that time. Let me try that again. I remembered in the darkness. <laughs> I remembered when I was in the darkness what I learned in the light. In other words, some of you right now are saying, huh, Danny, you're preaching to the choir here. I don't have no dark night of the soul. I'm doing just fine. I'm good. And uh, that's, that's okay. Your time is coming. <laughs> but you're, uh, because God loves you too. And he wants to help you grow in faith as well. And sometimes we are trying to come up with some kind of an experience to substitute for the presence of God when it might not be the presence of God. Now, does everybody still love me? I'm not saying the manifest presence of God is wrong or that it's bad, but sometimes we are, oh, Lord, I just pray, and, and I believe in breakthroughs, and I believe in praying, persevering prayers and so forth, but sometimes we'll come into a worship meeting and say, Lord, I just pray that you come down from heaven. I pray that you'd manifest yourself. I pray that you'd be a I just, oh, Lord, give us a breakthrough. Give us a, and, and the Lord says, nah. Not tonight. You remember the story in 1 Kings chapter 19 where uh, Elijah was walking by a mountain and it says, and a mighty wind blew. But God was not in the wind. Then an earthquake happened. But God was not in the earthquake. And then a rushing fire came through, but God was not in the fire. Then it says what? God was in the still small voice. Some of us can't even hear God when he's speaking in a still, small voice because we're too busy trying to get a breakthrough from God. Maybe he just wants you to chill, relax, go to the beach, wait, go eat some ice cream, just, just chill out. And maybe God just wants to say, you know what? You're okay. You're good. It's okay. Just relax. I love you. Read Hebrews 3 and 4. Enter into the rest of faith and chill. Everything's going to be fine. But... Um, and sometimes he will come in a still, small voice. Now, how many of you know that on the day of Pentecost, he came in a rushing mighty wind, yeah? Also on the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire came upon the disciples' heads. Also, in the book of Acts chapter 16, Paul got busted out of jail because of an earthquake. So God can move in fire, wind, and earthquakes. But he can also in the still, small voice. Now, I got friends, more of my non-charismatic, non-Pentecostal friends, uh, crunchy Presbyterians, I call them. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I just offended all the Presbyterians. But um, they're very quiet, and they say, Danny, when the Holy Spirit comes, it's always quiet. I said, okay. But what if God wants it? Now, I got other friends that are chandelier swinging Pentecostals, <laughs> and man, they, wanna, they want the power of God to fall in every meeting, but God might say, nah, not tonight. You guys got to cool down and be like these Presbyterians over here. Other times he's got to do, you see what I'm saying? Let God be the Lord of your life, but don't have your life to be founded on something that you might think is the presence of God and it might not be at all. God is not up in heaven waiting for you to snap your fingers so he can come and serve you. That's a question we got to ask ourselves. Who's serving who around here? We're serving him. What does he want to do? And he might want to do a still small voice and he might want to do a rushing mighty wind. And you know what? 
that's up to him for whatever he wants to do. There's a verse in 2 Chronicles that says, God left Hezekiah to see what was really in his heart. You can interpret that any way you want, but my Bible says he left Hezekiah to see what was in his heart. Same thing happened with Abraham. How could God tell Abraham to take his son up to an altar and offer him for a sacrifice? Wow. Because God wanted to see what was in Abraham's heart, and that's what the Scripture says. So God will test us, not because he's trying to jack us around, not because he's trying to play arbitrary rules and I'll pick you. And not. No, it's because he loves all of us and he will sovereignly look into our lives and to grow our faith and to help us to grow in faith, he'll withdraw himself sometimes and let you abide in the dark night of the soul. My point is, is that as long as you examine your heart and there's no sin in there and as long as the devil's not beating you up and you can't find any evidence for those things, Abide in the darkness until God gets you to the light at the other side of the tunnel, and he will. But perhaps not until he has accomplished what he wants to accomplish by helping you to grow in faith. Got me? I got one more point. Hang in there with me. Number three, we want to look at the area of the adjective of faithfulness. Now, do we have Psalm 16? Will we be able to get that up there? There we go. All right. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Lord, I have a beautiful inheritance. Now, there's different ways of looking at this verse depending on your Bible translation. But uh, the, New American, the New International Bible says, You have assigned me my portion and my cup. So every one of us has an assignment from the Lord. You've assigned me my portion and my cup. Now, portion just means I've got my portion, you've got your portion, the next guy's got his portion, we all have a portion. And then it says that you hold or you've made my lot secure. Now what this is, this is a throwback to when the children of Israel had the promised land divided up into different um, lots, pieces of land depending on the clan, the tribe, the family, and they tried to have an equitable distribution of the land. And this is in Joshua chapter 13 to 21. But he says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Now, what is he trying to say here? He's trying to picture your life and my life as an as a inheritance, as a plot of land. And that's what the lot is. The portion is how big your particular lot is. The lines, the imagery is given here of God up in heaven, and he's dropping boundary lines on the layman uh, plot, and then he's boundary lines on, on Amy's plot, and then he's got uh, um, Beck's plot, and then he's got Ari's plot, and so he's got all the different plots, and we, we, we should respond by saying, I have a delightful inheritance. And one of the things that steals your faithfulness and kills your faith is when you're not happy or content with the inheritance God has given you. It says the boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. Uh, I have written a couple of books, and uh, my best-selling book sold 70,000 copies. Pretty good, pretty good sales. But uh, a couple years ago, I was uh, watching a television show, and uh, there was a, a, a breakout in an Atlanta jail, and some guy shot a judge, and there was a dragnet throughout the city of Atlanta trying to find this bad guy. He was armed and dangerous. He broke into this lady's house, and um, um, she was just getting ready to go pick up her daughter from, from her soccer lessons or something, and he comes in, and she's been see seeing this on the television, so she figures, I'm dead. So he's walking back and forth, and he's got his gun, and she thinks he's going to shoot him at any time, and she's been reading Rick Warren's book called The Purpose Driven Life. So after about three hours, she says, are you hungry? And he says, yeah. She says, you want some pancakes? He says, yeah. You know, she said, well, you either kill me or you get some pancakes, so I'll let you have some pancakes. So he does the pancakes. She does the pancakes. And then she says, can I read this book to you? So she read the book, and at that chapter, it was that God has a plan for you and an inheritance for you. She read that book to him. He ended up surrendering to the police, and he's in prison today. But um, I want to tell you what was in my wicked little heart when I saw that story. And don't look at me so holy, because it would have been in your heart too. <laughs> but I see that and I say, now, that's going to jack Rick Warren's book sales up a couple of million bucks. 
and Rick Warren has already sold 32 million copies of that stinking book, and I got a stinking 60,000 on mine, and all that money's gone. Why couldn't, why couldn't she be reading my book when she got busted there? You know, <laughs> Lord says, Danny, you're looking over the inheritance, and if you look over your inheritance at the one guy, you'll be intimidated. If you look over the inheritance at the guy next to you, you might be proud because you think you're better than them. It's never good to, to uh, compare and to compete with one another. So we have to be able to say, hey, whatever inheritance I have, it's a good inheritance. I have a delightful inheritance. I had a uh, unfortunate situation happen. Um, it's a long time ago, about 15, 20 years ago. I got in a fight, uh, a major fight with a major YWAM leader. You're all trying to guess who it is, aren't you? <laughs> I ain't going to tell you. But um, uh, it, it, was, it was rough. And how many, how many of you know Christians fight sometimes? Ari, right, these guys are so holy. These, none of these guys fight. This is incredible. Well, just take it and give it to your carnal friends back home, but I, I want to just give you this illustration. So I'm, I'm so angry in this one thing, and I really thought this guy was wrong. Matter of fact, just thinking about it right now, I get ticked off just thinking about it. But uh, I thought he was wrong. He thought I was wrong, and we had this kind of standoff, but he outranked me. So I, I said, oh, what's this? Uh, you're the big guy and the bully in the schoolyard. You just push me around. He goes, well, if that's the way you look at it. I said, that's the way I look at it. And, and he says, well, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. I said, I don't even agree with that. <laughs> I disagree that we're supposed to agree to disagree. I disagree. It. <laughs> and I got up, kicked my chair back, walked out, and slammed the door in the name of Jesus. <laughs> of course, thinking I was pretty righteous. And I got on an airplane. It happened in Kona. I was living in Honolulu at the time. I got on the airplane, and I got my pen out, and I said, Dear Lauren Cunningham, I'm resigning from this hot dog organization called Youth with a Mission because you've got some weird leaders here. And I'm sure Campus Crusade would love to have me, so I'm going to call them out tomorrow. <laughs> if not Campus Crusade, maybe OM. <laughs> Things get really bad, I'll go to the Boy Scouts. <laughs> but I'm leaving this YWAM organization. I quit. I'm resigning. So I got home, and I went to my dear wife, and I said, honey, I'm leaving youth with a mission. She said, what about me? <laughs> I said, you got to come with me because you got to be submitted, you know. The Bible says so. <laughs> How many of you know that never goes over very well, right? <laughs> so, so she says what good godly wife should say at a time like this, knowing your husband's about to go insane, is you say, honey, I think you ought to get some sleep. <laughs> I said, Okay. So I went to sleep, I got up the next morning, and I take a walk, and if I ever had an experience with the Father heart of God, it was that morning. He said, Danny, you were totally in the flesh last night. And I said, well, yeah, I know, but it was his fault. You know. Danny, I just want to ask you a question. I love you. I uh, gave you an inheritance in YWAM. I didn't give you an inheritance in Campus Crusade or in OM or in Calvary Chapel. I gave you an inheritance in YWAM. And you can go somewhere else looking for another inheritance, but that's the inheritance I gave you. And then he said this. He never told me I was right, although, wink, wink, I think I was. But he never told me I was right, but what he did say was, are you going to let another human being take away your inheritance? And think about that. Sometimes we get in fights or we get in disagreements and we go, well, I'm out of here, man. I'm just, uh, and God would just say, did I tell you to leave? Because the, as they say, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Don't look over somebody else's delightful lines of your inheritance. Just be happy with your inheritance. Now, let's keep going. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night or in the darkness also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Now look at these promises. Here is where he's stepping out on faith and he's proclaiming these promises of God. I've set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, and I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. Now he talks about the resurrection. My flesh also will dwell secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, could be translated to the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. And now he says, you've made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's that word, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. This, this psalm is quoted several times in the New Testament. And what God is basically saying there, in his presence is fullness of joy. 
God doesn't want to leave you in the darkness forever, but he also doesn't want to leave you in unbelief forever. And he also doesn't want to treat you like a little baby all the time. Oh, you got to experience my manifest presence today. My omnipresence is not good enough for you. Well, come, 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 let me chill out. No. Let God be the one to decide this. Now, I love the presence of God as much as the next guy. Well, maybe it depends who the next guy is. But um, I'm a Pentecostal. I believe in all that stuff. I'm just simply saying sometimes God doesn't care how high we jump. He just wants to make sure we walk straight when we land. And that has to do with, there's another, uh, another uh, profound one right there. Man, I'm catching up. <laughs> you have assigned me my portion and my cup, and so forth and so on. Now, so here's my parting shot. That don't try to be big. Try to be faithful. Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, he said, He that is faithful in that which is little is ruler over much. He that is faithful in the natural I'll make him ruler over the spiritual. He that is faithful in his own stuff, or I should say, he who is faithful in another's stuff will be given stuff of his own to be able to be faithful over. Um, In 1961, there was a guy by the name of Edward Lorenz. He was a scientist. He worked at the Bell Laboratories. And then back in those days, they had these big mainframe computers that was as big as a refrigerator. And he went over to this one, and he was trying to predict a weather pattern. He was kind of a uh, meteorologist type guy. And he's partly trying to find out the weather, partly doing some experiments. So he walks over to the, to the computer, and he says, .509741. He knows the computer's going to take a while to tabulate the results. So he goes up and makes himself a cup of coffee. And um, he comes back and finds the whole weather pattern has totally changed because he had put in 509742 instead of 509741. He was a hundredths of a thousandths of a percentage point off, and it changed the whole weather pattern. Because one little calculation went to another, went to another, molecules started to hit one another, and then they ended up with bazillions of random chance chaos encounters, and they came up with this experiment, and they called it the butterfly effect. And they said that... Theoretically, now this is in the 60s, theoretically, a butterfly could flap its wings in Tasmania and be the ultimate variable in a earth, I mean, a, 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 a tornado happening in Oklahoma in the United States. How could that be? Because so many of these variables depend on one another. So why am I giving that illustration? It's because you never know what God's going to do with your little faithfulness that you have in what God's called you to do. And we have a tendency to try to, to go after something that God might not want us to go after. And Lauren has given us this teaching, and it's just a basic biblical teaching, that we don't want to separate the secular from the sacred. We want to be able to realize that everything is sacred. Um, I was in England a couple years ago at a um, big missionary conference, and I was with some big name people, and uh, we were figuring on some missionary strategies for church planting among unreached people groups and getting the Bible into different languages and getting the Jesus film out and so forth and so on. So I decided to call up my mother. I mean, I decided to call up my wife's mother. I decided to call up my wife, who was watching her mother, who has had severe brain damage and a, um, uh, a severe uh, dementia. And so she, my wife has to watch her 24 hours a day and just to keep her safe and everything. So I called up my wife, and um, I just say, hi, honey, I said, I'm doing this, and I met with John Dawson for lunch, and then I met with Lauren Cunningham, and I'm going to go into London and meet with George Verwer, and we're going to talk about that, and I'm talking big stuff, you know, and I said, golly, honey, I've been talking about myself for the last 10 minutes. Why don't you talk about me for a while? And she said, no, she didn't say that. And so uh, I said, oh, I have been talking about myself. What's been going on with you? She said, well, I just got through wiping your mother-in-law's rear end and experiencing the presence of Jesus. I went, wait a minute. Maybe what I'm doing is not so big, and maybe what you're doing is really the next big thing. And oftentimes, we are shortchanging the simple things of the Christian life. A little choice. Jesus said, if you give somebody a cup of cold water in my name, you get a reward. Something as simple as that. So how do I wrap this all up tonight? It's this. It's that for foundations for the faith, to put in the right rebar, to make sure our, our footings are deep enough, to make sure we have a foundation for faith that will stand the rockiness of these perilous times that are coming. 
You don't even have to be a rapture-believing, second-coming freak to know that we're living in the last days. By the way, let me have a little experiment here. How many of you believe we're living in the last days? Okay. Those of you who didn't raise your hands are wrong. Because <laughs> the Bible says three times we're living in the last days when the Bible was written. That was a trick question, but I did it anyhow. <laughs> but the point is, as time goes on, the Bible predicts, according to Jesus in Matthew 24, according to Paul, according to most of the scriptures, you can take some Old, Old Testament scriptures, the darkness is coming, and the attacks on the word of God are incredible. But I can report to you, we now have in Youth with a Mission, we have over 80 nine-month SBSs around the world. We have over 60 BCCs or Bible core courses around the world. We have a new school that just started called the Discipleship Bible School that has about a dozen and it's multiplying like crazy. We have other schools called the School of the Bible and the Bible School for the Nations and so many because, and among the young people, as I travel around, I'm seeing people that are hungry for the Word of God. And so let's nurture that hunger and let's, let's uh, uh, you know, I, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, it says in the Bible. And so let's be people who love the Lord who walk in faithful obedience to God, who have a foundation of the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints. And then, of course, let us be people who can believe God for us to bring this generation to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. Father, we just thank you for these simple texts about stewardship, about servanthood, about faithfulness, and about the things you have given us. We pray that you would help us to um, contend for the faith which was once for all entrusted to the saints and knowing that in the last days some will depart from the faith and we need to fight the fight of the faith. Help us as well, Lord, to be able to just be faithful people, to be faithful to pick up a, a candy wrapper on the floor, to be faithful to pick up a, a something even out on the sidewalk that's not our responsibility, Lord, to, but to, to take what is our responsibility as children of God and to do what you've called us to do. Make us to be faithful people, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.